I thank the chair. Madam President, this is the uh, eighth in my series of speeches on the line item veto. Last week, I spoke of the devastation uh, wreaked by Hannibal's army upon Italy during the Second Punic War. For 16 years, Hannibal maintained the war in Italy without once releasing his army from service in the field. But he kept control of the thousands of men without a single indication of disaffection toward himself or toward each other. Even though he had troops in his army of many nationalities. He had Libyans and Iberians and Gauls and Carthaginians and Ligurians and Bruttians and Greeks, Numidians, who had nothing in common with each other, neither laws nor customs nor language. And yet the skill of this commander was such that in spite of these differences so manifold and so wide, there was never one word of disobedience to his command. or to his single iron will. Unlike uh, Caesar and Alexander and Paris, Hannibal was never the subject. of an assassination plot, or even a hint of conspiracy on the part of his troops. Also unlike uh, Alexander, Hannibal was virtually forsaken by his native country of Carthage, receiving no re reinforcements, or very few at best, and no money from his homeland. And yet, Hannibal's polyglot army had to be paid. And so he plundered the countryside and uh, the ancient shrines where offerings in gold and silver dating from immemorial times were used to pay his mercenaries. The losses of the Romans, as we have witnessed, have been frightful. Many of Rome's elite had been wiped out. And much of the wealth of Italy, its livestock, its crops, its cultivated land, its houses and equipment, was destroyed over vast areas, especially in southern Italy. And yet, the determination of the Senate and the iron discipline of the Roman people persevered. 
Any city that cooperated with Hannibal could expect no mercy. But only the most severe punishment for its infidelity to Rome. I will cite one example. Capua. Capua, Capua in Campania was the largest city in Rome in Italy except Rome. And it was the richest city on the peninsula, second only to Rome itself. In uh, 216 BC, following Hannibal's devastating defeat of the Romans at Cannae, Capia revolted against Rome and went over to Hannibal's side. But Hannibal had no spare troops with which to garrison cities that yielded to him. And this uh, revealed a severe weakness in uh, Hannibal's uh, overall situation. His was an army of conquest, not an army of occupation. So the Romans sought to recoup Capua and take it back from Hannibal. They besieged the city over a long period of time. And uh, in 211, after five years of a state of infidelity toward Rome, Capua was doomed to fall. And its uh, people recognized their fate. Vibibus Verius, a Capuan, who had been one of the main instigators of collusion with Hannibal, said to the governing body of Capua that he would never be chained and dragged through the streets of Rome, only to be bound to a stake to be beaten and beheaded. He said, all those who wish to yield to fate and uh, avoid witnessing the destruction of the city should attend a banquet which he had prepared at his house. After they had eaten and drunk to their satisfaction, The same cup would be passed to them that had been given to him. A toast uh, containing poison 
would spare their bodies of torture, their minds of insult, their eyes the sight and their ears the sound of the wretched indignities that were sure to befall the conquered. There would be persons, he said, uh, prepared to place their lifeless bodies on a huge funeral pyre in the courtyard of his house. And Livy, the Roman historian, tells us that 27 senators accompanied Vibibus to his house. After they had dined, uh, so far as they were able, they drowned all thought of impending doom in wine and then swallowed the poison. With the close of the, ma of the banquet, they grasped each other's hands and with one last final embrace, they breathed their last. Before the walls of the city were opened to the Romans. Vibibus was uh, right in his estimation of the Roman desire for vengeance. Seventy collaborators who had been compromised by the plans to revolt against Rome were also executed along with other uh, leaders. 300 nobles were condemned to chains. It was a, a terrible punishment that was visited upon the Capuans by the Romans. After the executions had uh, ended by the decree of the Senate of Rome, One of the Capuans, Eubelius Tauria, spelled with a J. I'm advised that in that language and in those ancient times, there was no letter with a J sound in the alphabet. So while it is spelled J-U-B-E-L-L-I-U-S, it is pronounced as a Y. Eubelius Tauria approached the Roman consul Fulvius and cried out to him, since thou art so thirsty for our blood, why not strike me thyself that thou mayest boast of having killed a braver man than thou? Fulvius answered, I should like well to do it, but a decree of the Senate forbids. Eubelius rejoined, well then, I will show thee something that thou dost not have the courage to do. Whereupon he killed his wife, his children, and then himself. A 
Now, Madam President, uh, last week we followed the expansion of the Roman territory and noted that it was uh, an expansion that left Rome in complete control of the Mediterranean Sea. We noted that Rome organized new, print, new provinces in Africa, in, or in Africa, in Asia, in hither Spain and farther Spain, that she extended her dominion over Macedonia, Greece, and restored her control over Cisalpine Gaul, which had been disturbed during the Hannibalic invasion. She also extended her dominion over Sicily, Sardinia, Corsica, the Balearic Islands, and therefore was established on both continents of Asia and Africa, in addition to the areas in Europe adjoining the Mediterranean. So the growth in the Roman territory was uh, phenomenal. Also, during this period, the Senate had increased its power uh, and influence. Several facts account for the growth in the Senate's power. First of all, During the Punic War, the Senate had taken over the control of the government entirely. It managed the battles through the consuls, advised the consuls how to proceed, took over the war, and, aver and emerged from the Second Punic War uh, stronger than ever. Secondly, unlike the consuls, who at the end of their one-year term were subject to uh, having to answer to the Roman people for any uh, mistakes they had made during their term of office. The Senate was a permanent organ of government. The source of the Senate's power was its autoritas, autoritas, which carried both uh, religious and constitutional connotations. In practice, the term meant the prestige and esteem that the Senate possessed based on custom and precedent. Only to the Roman Senate belonged the antique tradition unbroken from the earliest beginnings of the Roman state. Only to the Senate belong that dignity. The Roman Senate had existed from the time of the kings, having been created by the legendary first king, 
Romulus. It had survived the monarchy and had come down through almost 500 years now of the Republic. Constitutionally, Arcturus was the power to ratify the actions of the popular assembly, um, approve the election of magistrates, uh, issue Senatus Consulta advising those magistrates, and control of the purse. We have noted that time and time again that before a bill or resolution could become law, it had to be approved by the Roman Senate. So there was this check and balance between the popular assembly and the Senate. As in our own situation, a bill, before it can become law, must pass both houses and be exactly alike, alike in every jot and tittle, every period, semicolon, colon, parentheses, in both bills the bill in the Senate, the bill as it passes the House, and vice versa. Now, underlying this system requiring the legislation to pass both bodies during the Roman Republic was the religious idea that a bill or resolution to become law had to be pleasing the gods. The Roman Senate had complete control of the finances. No monies could be earmarked for war. No monies could be earmarked for public works, except by the Senate. A soldier could not re receive his pay, nor a victorious general his triumph, unless money for the purpose had been provided by the Senate. The Senate's control over the finances and over military and foreign policy, and even over the courts, remained unchallenged until the time of Tiberius Gracchus in 133 BC. The Roman Senate often reduced the consuls and other magistrates to obedient executors of the Senate's will. Even the tribunes formerly the champions and protectors of the people, have become the willing tools and accomplices of the Senate. Not even the powerful censors, except for the irascible and aggressive Cato, ventured to challenge the Senate. Now, a new man, the handicaps, 
that a new man, Novus Homo, had to overcome to gain one of the higher offices or a seat in the assembly were numerous and difficult. Only a rich man could stand the expenses of an election campaign and hold an office for which he was paid no salary. His chances of election were slim. If uh, he were opposed by a member of an old and Ill illustrious family, supported by numerous clients, powerful friends, and influential connections, only those with exceptional ability and personality like Cato, Marius, or Cicero, could burst through the bars of exclusion. Such was the special caste that ruled the Senate. Cicero was convinced that the perpetuation of Republican government and the preservation of it depended upon maintaining the supremacy of the Senate. And we'll, we'll see more of Cicero in future days. His idea of of the ideal state was a state that was governed according to law. And to the magistrates would be allotted the executive power, to the Senate authority, and to the people liberty. Madam President, uh, during the period that Rome was experiencing this phenomenal, phenomenal territorial expansion, Economic and uh, social life in Italy began to experience profound changes. Remember that the old virtues of the Roman people Old virtues like our own family values and other virtues that we have known since the beginning and prior thereto of our own republic had guided the Roman people through 600 years of wars and trials and triumphs from the time when Rome was but a struggling, fledgling city on the Tiber to her present position as a world power. The virtues of honesty and frugality and adaptability to changing circumstances abhorrence of bribery and corruption, respect for law, 
And the admirable balance of government, and I emphasize this, the admirable balance of government between the powers of the consuls, the Senate, and the popular assembly. had excited the admiration of Polybius, the Greek who wrote history about Rome as late as about um, 150 BC. And so during this period, beginning with the expansion of Roman territory, and more particularly during the second century BC, and especially as I should think uh, beginning about mid-century of BC. Life throughout the peninsula underwent a profound uh, change. Despite uh, Rome's immense conquest of land, all too many people in Rome and throughout uh, Italy suffered from poverty and want and privation and famine. Large plantation type farms cultivated by slave labor began to replace the small family farms. Because only the wealthy could afford to introduce new kinds of crops new breeds of livestock. And the spread of these, of the latifundia, the large landed estates, caused increasing numbers of peasants to lose their homesteads. And uh, it drove increasing numbers of small farmers from the countryside to unemployment in the town. And as we view these kaleidoscopic changes and events, there emer we see emerging two opposing political factions, the Optimates and the Populares. The Optimates included the bulk of the senatorial politicians who were devoted to the perpetuation of oligarchy. They were bitterly opposed to any change in the existing situation that affected their prestige, their political influence, or their economic interests. Their advantages lay in their wealth and inherited reputations, their numerous 
and large clientele at home and abroad, and their control of the Senate. And by their control of their Senate, the Senate, their control of the administration of government. The populares, unlike the optimates, represented the discontented elements of the country who demanded varying sorts of reform. The populares did not uh, lead as homogeneous a group as did the optimates. They represented uh, many different interests and many different classes, which were not as likely to uh, form a united front in the many crises that uh, were to come during what was to be a, an extended conflict. Most of the uh, leadership of the populares was drawn from a minority faction in the Senate. Now, there certainly burst upon the stage of Roman history Tiberius, Sempronius, and Gracchus. the public-spirited son of one of Rome's most eminent aristocrats who was married to Cornelia, the daughter of Scipio Africanus. We've heard the story of Cornelia, who married uh, a Tiberius Gracchus, the father of the Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus of whom we now speak. And uh, Cornelia was the mother of 12 children. She lost all of her children except three, two sons and one daughter. The daughter was named Sempronia, and the sons were named Tiberius and Gaius. And one day, as a neighbor came by to visit uh, Cornelia, the neighbor displayed all of her jewelry, and she turned to Cornelia, this great Roman woman, the mother of the Gracchi, and said, do you have any jewelry? And Cornelia turned to her two remaining sons, Tiberius and Gaius, and said, these are my jewels. So Tiberius, uh, Sempronius Gracchi, was elected tribune for the year 133 B.C. And he saw in the movement of small farmers to the cities a menace to the Roman state. So he, he, he introduced a law which was enacted to uh, deal with the problem of overpopulation in Rome and also to reestablish the Italian peasantry on the land. His bill provided that the soldiers and the peasants were to be settled on the large landed estates that had been captured by the Republic in its many wars in Italy and leased to the wealthy ranchers. Uh, of course, his legislation ran into 
opposition, but he sought to placate the rich landowners. But in spite of his efforts, uh, the legislation was defeated, was uh, vetoed. Vetoed by another tribune. Octavius. Well, Tiberius then resorted to an unprecedented procedure. He introduced a motion to depose Tiber uh, Octavius of his office of tribune. And uh, it was a an illegal procedure, but it carried. So Octavius was deposed. The Roman Senate then sought to hamper the land commission from carrying out its duties. Tiberius and his brother Gaius and his father-in-law, Appius Claudius Pul Pulcher, had been elected as the three members of the land commission to enforce the law, the land law. So the, the Senate sought to hamper the operation of the Land Commission by refusing to appropriate the monies for its expenses. Tiberius then uh, proposed that the money be provided from the treasury of King Attalus III, about whom we spoke last week, and who had just died after bequeathing his kingdom to Rome. So this was an unheard of thing. The Senate had, from times immemorial, had complete control over the treasury, over foreign policy. And here Tiberius was proposing that the money come from some, somewhere else. from a foreign treasury. Well, this, of course, represented a revolutionary challenge in a constitutional sense to the Senate's control over the finances and over foreign policy. At the same time, Tiberius announced his intention to run for re-election to the office of Tribune which was a very unusual thing. And contrary to established uh, procedure. Well, the sen senatorial extreme extremists were determined to prevent his reelection. And they organized their clients and slaves who attacked Tiberius and his followers during a public meeting in the Forum. Tiberius and 300 of his adherents were massacred and their bodies thrown into the Tiber. Nine years later, Gaius Gracchus, the younger brother of Tiberius, was elected tribune. He supported the agrarian policy of his dead brother Tiberius, but his aims were even more far-reaching than the policies of Tiberius, and they made Gaius even more popular than Tiberius. So much more, in fact, that in spite of custom and practice, he was re-elected to the office of tribune for the year 123 BC. The changes he advocated and brought about favored the business class, as well as the proletariat, and were clearly designed to weaken the Senate. He uh, 
instigated an action by a fellow tribune, Asilius, to reorganize the Court of Claims. And to provide that no magistrates in office, no senator, no father, brother, or son of a senator serve on the panel from which the 50 judges hearing each case were selected. Gaius thus brought about a transfer of the control over the tribunal from the senatorial order and placed it in the hands of the businessmen who were thereafter referred to as the equestrian order. Gaius then sought to deal with the problems of the uh, impoverished peoples throughout Italy by passing a grain law. The grain law provided that the government should sell a fixed quantity of grain each month to the residents of Rome at a price considerably less than the market rate, thus constituting a regular demand upon the treasury. and accepting the doctrine that the government was responsible for the poor. Now, the recipients of this uh, cheap grain did not uh, receive it gratis, but had to pay for it. Therefore, Gaius cannot strictly be accused of having instituted a grain dole But a first step had been taken in that direction. And the way pointed out to office seekers to court the goodwill of the people at the expense of the state. Does that remind us of our own times? Gaius then endeavored to pass legislation, legislation in the interests of the poorer citizens by requiring that the government provide soldiers with clothing free of charge and not subtract the cost thereof from their pay. Make no deductions from the pay of the soldiers for the clothing that they had to wear. Now, the law also uh, prohibited the enlistment of troops under 17 years of age. Additionally, uh, Gaius uh, introduced uh, an, agrarian, uh, an agrarian law which reduced the amount of land that anyone could hold throughout uh, Italy 
considerably below the maximum set by his brother, Tiberius, when he had been tribune. This, of course, offered further opportunities to relieve over overpopulation in, in Rome. Another law that was pushed through to enactment by Gaius was the law affecting uh, the collection of taxes in Asia. In the, in the newly organized uh, province uh, of Asia. This law provided that uh, the control or the contract, that the contracts for the collection of the tax of 10% on the produce of all agricultural land in the province of Asia should be let by the censors in Rome to a single company of Publicana. And of course, this opened up opportunities for Roman businessmen to make huge profits. By this act and by the Acilian law, transferring the control of the courts out of the hands of the senatorial order into the hands of the equestrian order, businessmen. Gaius had endeared himself to the businessmen, had won their support, and he therefore announced that he would be a candidate for re-election to a third term as tribune. But the influence with the tribal assembly, the reduced uh, influence, as a matter of fact, with the tribal assemb assembly, which meant the end of political power for Gaius, the end of his political power, was brought about largely through the machinations of the Optimates, and Gaius failed to be re-elected to the office. Now, Mr. President, both of the Gracchi brothers were earnest patriots. But in their efforts to overcome the opposition to their measures, they had followed a course that shook the foundation of government. And they had uh, provided a direct challenge to the traditional control of the Senate over the government. And the Senate, as a result, lost greatly in power and authority. In addition to the loss of some of its uh, prerogatives, the Senate was also weakened by the consolidation of the businessmen into a vigorous political faction that often opposed it. And the great future crises would result from the divided political leadership between these hostile political factions, the Optimates and the Populares. The Senate was headed into a slow decline, which would be followed by the decline in time of the Republic. 
It would be a slow process brought about by bloody civil wars, um, the overextension of the territorial administration of the Roman government. The growing influence of the military and the milita and mil and military leaders, the continuing erosion of the Senate's power and authority, and the gradual corrosion of Roman virtues and the Roman character. Finally, uh, Mr. President, despite the adherence of many senators to the ideals of the Roman moral tradition, the corrupting influence of money, of wealth, and of political power and of a slave economy had shown itself in the destruction of Carthage and Corinth and New Mantua. So the cracks in the fabric were appearing. Having transformed itself into an exclusive and arbitrary oligarchy, the Senate had exposed itself to attacks, the attacks of the Gracchi brothers. And their efforts toward reform, and especially the, the way they went about accomplishing reform, weaken the Senate, and set in motion a chain of inexorable events that occurred over the next hundred years and that finally resulted in the collapse of the Republic. Mr. President, we shall uh, pursue these uh, developments following the observance of America's Independence Day. I yield the floor.